Well, um, good morning. Let me just check, make sure that everything's going as it should do here. Uh, always a good idea to check and make sure. Yep, that seems to be there. Hanai, hi there, Millbilly. Your video yesterday, very, very interesting. Um, oh, just as I've started. That um, person that's done that video of uh, saying, you know, that uh, I believe, I believe that uh, this is uh, Steve saying that, uh, oh, this is T Teresa and she's still breathing and now she's gone. <laughs> um, here are the notes on my piano, the notes of B and C. Play them together and they are horrible. Yep. They are horrible. That's, that is uh, regarded as a very ugly interval. It's what's known as a minor second. It's an ugly interval. It sounds horrible, but it's used a lot in music. You think, what? Seriously? You would use? Yeah, absolutely. To make something really. Um, to sound really nice. So. If you take it out of context, B and C, or C sharp and D, or a D sharp and E, E and F together, ugly. Um, an, an, aug an augmented first would be another way of describing it, an augmented first, um, but they're just horrible. And yet when you play them, B and C together in the chord of C major seventh, Sounds really nice because you're putting them in into context. Same with the D, D uh, C sharp and D. Same with the E. And the E and the F together. Sound beautiful. Um, and I, and I think the uh, what what was so bizarre was that for somebody to say that, you know, he thought that this was uh, Stephen referring to Teresa. Well, pal, all you need to do is listen to the rest of the conversation. You know, this is a, this is a phone call from a jail. You know, th this isn't Stephen tell, telling previously to that, oh, you know, I've got, I've got somebody tied to the bed next door um, and I've been raping her and slitting her throat and cutting her hair and, you know, sending her text messages, sex messages. No, you know, this, it was absolutely ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. So many thanks to um, um, Millbilly for sharing that. Uh, Jazz and Az, um, yeah. And do you know why that is? Because he was complaining to me about the fact that there were all these one-star reviews Um and what you'll find is that you have on um, Amazon, you've got confirmed uh, purchases um, and people can, can, you know, obviously write, write their reviews and their confirmed purchases. And then you've got the ones that aren't. So all that Kratz has done is created loads of fictitious accounts in order to get his book um, a better review. It's, uh, it, yeah, it, it, it's pretty mad. Um, yeah, absolutely. It, it's just Kratz himself that's gone and put on all these uh, five-star reviews. Um, but like I've said before, I don't personally, um, I mean, obviously the um, Teresa Holbach, Mike Holbach dynamic is interesting because... Um, um, you know, um, Teresa's dad died, and so his brother became, and this, this goes way, way back to biblical times, what's known as a kinsman redeemer. And, and it says that you can, uh, you know, the, the brother, 
um, has the sort of, if, if you like, the right to then marry the um, the widow. Um, and there are examples of that in the Bible. Go back to the to the book of Ruth, um, one of the shortest uh, books in the Bible. Um, but it refers to this kinsman redeemer idea where Ruth ends up marrying um, marrying this fella and they end up they are the I'm going to say either the great parent parents or the, the great grandparents or the grandparents of David um, and obviously therefore the either the great 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 grandparents or great grandparents of Solomon yeah. Um, you can you can you can check it up anyway that's in the uh, uh, that's, it's just one of those interesting dynamics isn't it you know it's like um, you know Teresa was his in effect his cousin and then becomes his sister um, but I, I don't I don't think I don't surely hope not that uh, Mike Holbach was involved in uh, murdering Teresa. Um, I do have suspicions though, huge suspicions about him being involved in her disappearance and certainly the framing of Steve alongside his pal who he's always seems to be alongside Ryan. Uh, they're all smiling um, with Jupiter's delight. Um, uh, one you're more than welcome to, sh to stay and uh, we won't make it too much bible study okay we, we won't we won't do too much of that <laughs> um and yeah if look if <laughs> if it turns out that everything that mike said was due to him being distressed and and you know stuff like that fine but what on earth were the journalists and the police doing by not investing, not ask, not even asking him? What do you mean the grieving process when she's only a missing person? What do you mean could only last days? It's, you know, th there's my big uh, bugbear, if you like. So anyway, um, as, I, as I promised yesterday, I have done a little bit more research on the, uh, the leaflet here. Um, that. let me just pop it up here's the uh, the leaflet in question it's a leaflet issued by the uh, county in in Texas a handbook go back up a bit handbook for families of murder victims and people who assist them right, let's go to this one um this is page 43 this is the chapter chapter first of all this is to do with the it says understanding the district attorney's office so so this is more or less how how things are supposed to supposed to go down as it were uh, most families of murder victims have an intense desire to see that justice is served and that the murderer is prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. And yet we've got Mike Holbach at sentencing saying that Brendan should have taken the plea deal. Hmm. However, families of murder victims are not directly involved in the criminal source lawsuits filed against murderers. It is the role of the state to prosecute the murderer and the district attorney has the duty to pursue charges against the person responsible or persons for committing, for having committed the crime. Once the accused person has been charged with the crime, he or she becomes known as the defendant. The district attorney's office becomes the prosecutor. Rules that govern the actions of the district attorney are specifically spelled out by law and must be strictly followed. Uh, not, not so in Manitowoc. 
not so in many trials. Families of murder victims who often want instant justice and stiff sentences. Once again, the families want stiff sentences. Why is Mike Holbach saying that Brendan should have taken a plea deal? They tend to be frustrated by rules, but the proper guidelines must always be adhered to, working with the district attorney. Now, I'm looking, obviously, we're looking for the bit where it says that, you know, the family has to come up with some person to act as the spokesperson and alternate um, press conferences. Okay, so we're looking forward to, to that bit. Many families discover that criminal justice process to be slow, unresponsive and in general insensitive to their needs and to the memory of their loved ones frustration often results from a seeming lack of progress in the case families often feel angry with the district attorney because of things said in the courtroom families need to realize that the prosecuting attorney assigned to their case is working for them not against them the goal of every prosecuting attorney is the successful prosecution and punishment of the defendant yeah no mention there at all about finding the truth is there however each attorney has a number of serious cases assigned to him her at any given time and must devote time to each to see that justice is done families are welcome to discuss the case with the attorney but the victim assistance coordinator in large counties has more time available to assist the family and is probably a more appropriate person to answer the family's questions. That's the victim assistance coordinator. In my 10 years with the district attorney's office, I have met the most amazing people in the worst circumstances of their life. Their courage and strength are testaments to the memory of their loved one. I only wish I had more time to get to know each of them. But at the end of the case, there is always another family who is hurting and needs my help. And I must be there for them as well. Understanding the district attorney's office. After the police department has a suspect in custody and the investigation is completed, the district attorney's office is consulted to determine whether or not the case should be prosecuted. The intake section is a particular or the particular branch of the district attorney's office devoted to making this decision. The intake section screens cases submitted by the police agencies to determine if there is a probable cause to justify filing the case. Once filed, additional investigation is sometimes required. In the case of felonies, the intake section also determines whether a case should be sent directly to the grand jury instead of filing the case with the district attorney's office. Generally, the district attorney's office will not review a case for filing unless the police have met one of the following requirements. The defendant was arrested at the time the crime was committed. The defendant was arrested under lawful circumstances for another crime. The police arrested the defendant after obtaining a probable cause warrant. If these guidelines were not followed, the attorney handling the defect for the district attorney's office should discuss these problems with the filing officer. Additional investigation could possibly eliminate these flaws. Guidelines used by the filing attorney to screen cases include uh, a criminal offence has been committed and classification and identif identification of the crime has been made. All elements of the offence can be proved through admissible evidence that is outlined in the case report submitted for filing the crime date is known the place where the crime was committed to establish proper venue is known mm. the person or persons charged with the crime actually committed the crime the evidence as to the identify of the person charged is admissible Probable cause exists for a traffic stop, arrest, search or seizure. Other, uh, yeah. Other admissible evidence corroborates. Ah, 
Other admissible evidence corroborates accomplice testimony. Recovered property can be identified as the property that was originally reported as stolen. Any written confession was obtained as the result of a lawful arrest or search. The confession is specific enough to convict the person of the crime with which he, she is charged. Yeah, there was absolutely no... Remember Ken Kratt's words that Brendan uh, Dassey had given them specificity about the, the bullet being in the garage, so they went and searched it. And the, uh, the specificity with which he uh, told them about what had happened to Teresa. Anyway, carrying on. The value and identity of stolen property or property damaged or destroyed by criminal activity is properly established through admissible evidence. Injured parties are properly identified. An oral confession reveals information that results in the subsequent recovery of stolen property, property or evidence of the crime. Testimony of witnesses is admissible, competent, and will aid in establishing the guilt of the accused. Guilt of the accused is properly established. Lack of effective consent to the injured party is established where necessary. Probable cause arrest warrants and search warrants are based on proper affidavits and meet necessary guidelines. The accused is in custody at the time of filing or has been released on bond or to his her attorney for subsequent surrender. A magistrate has determined probable cause for continued detention of the defendant. When these requirements have been satisfied, the district attorney's office can proceed with filing of the case with the grand jury. The types of cases presented directly to the grand jury are those with either the person committing the crime or the facts surrounding the crime are in doubt, so the defendant has not been arrested. Okay, the grand jury is composed of 12 citizens who determine if there is enough evidence to prosecute the case. If there is sufficient evidence, the suspect is indicted for the crime. If there is not enough evidence, the suspect is no billed and will be released. If the suspect is indicted, the case will be assigned to a court and placed on that court's docket. Some people believe that all murders are capital murders. However, the legislator distinguishes murder from capital murder. Murder is defined as the intentional taking of another life. Capital murder requires that the murder occur in the course of committing or attempting to commit another felony, such as kidnapping or sexual assault. Capital murder can also occur when a police officer or a child under the age of six is killed or two or more people are killed in the same criminal episode penalty range for murder can be as little as five years and as much as a life sentence in the penitentiary if a defendant has never been convicted of a felony the jury may have community supervision before them as an alternative capital murder carries either a life sentence or the death penalty as a possible punishment however The death penalty is not sought in every capital murder case. The district attorney's office will decide whether or not to seek the death penalty after a thorough evaluation of the act. Plea bargaining. Now, this is important, obviously. The district attorney's office has the option to strike a plea bargain with a defendant prior to a case coming to trial. Plea bargaining has a negative connotation, but in reality, it is often a very efficient tool in moving cases through the court. So well, obviously, from the point of view of people reading this who have lost, lost a family member um, and are grieving for that reason, it's obviously, it's, it's saying here, plea bargain has a negative connotation. In other words, you know, family members don't want to be told that, well, you know, we want this... Um, suspect this defendant to be to be offered plea bargains what why, 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 why do you want to offer him a plea bargain you know we want to see him convicted uh, you know prosecuted convicted found guilty and then sentenced to the maximum possible sentence families don't want to hear district attorneys referring to plea bargains 
Um, for example, Tarrant County has only nine district courts to conduct jury trials for felony crimes. Realistically, even under good conditions, nine courts could only try around about 300 cases per year. However, in Tarrant County, the grand jury was expected to return more than 8,000 felony indictments in the year 2000, meaning that there was no possibility of bringing even 5% of the felony cases before a jury. And that's certainly something that, if you remember way back when we had a chat with Rob Bellin, and I'm hoping to get Rob back on pretty soon, he's going to get back to me with a, a possible time, um, something he pointed out, you know, that you just not are, you are, without these plea bargains, ridiculous though it is, you're not going to get through the, the cases. The remaining 7,600 or so cases Uh, I want to say 8,000, less 3,000, I think comes to 7,700. But anyway, we'll forgive them the mathematics. Or so cases must be handled in some way, and that usually is through plea bargaining. All large counties and many smaller ones face the same case overloads in the courts. After a criminal indictment, a trial attorney receives the evidence based upon experience with actual jurors from the community and estimates what a jury would do with the case if they heard it in a trial setting. Questions considered include, would the jury convict the accused? And if so, what punishment would the jury be likely to assess? The prosecution and the defense must negotiate the sentence based upon what their experience indicates that a jury would do. When negotiations fail and the case goes to trial, juries occasionally give a much harsher punishment than the state expected. Sometimes they are more lenient than anyone would have predicted. And sometimes they even acquit the defendant. As I say, it's pretty obvious, isn't it, that as, uh, that as members of the murdered person's family, Plea bargaining is not something you want to hear about. It's not something that you want these these defendants to possibly get off much lighter. In Texas, defendants have the right to have the jury set punishment unless they state in writing that they want a judge to determine punishment. The standard used to determine what a case is worth for plea bargaining purposes is based on the punishment previously decided upon by the average county jury. Therefore, the punishment imposed by a jury in one trial will affect the disposition of many other cases in which a plea bargain is ultimately reached. <coughs> there is a popular misconception that plea bargaining means the defendant always gets community supervision or that a felony case is always reduced to a less serious charge. This is not true. Occasionally a defendant will receive a probate sentence as a result of plea bargaining because the prosecutor knows that a jury usually would give probation in similar circumstances. While some felonies are reduced to lesser status, that is the exception rather than the rule. Generally, if a prosecutor believes that a jury would send a defendant to the penitentiary, then the plea bargaining often offer will be consistent. In Texas courts, there are also checks and balances in the plea bargaining system. The prosecutor can recommend a certain punishment to the judge, but if the judge who makes the final determination and he or she may reject the agreement, if it is found to be unfair either to the people or to the accused. Plea bargaining offers major advantages for the prosecution and ultimately the public. With certain rare exceptions, a plea bargain arising out a plea of guilty arising out of a plea bargain cannot be appealed. This means the public is guaranteed that the defendant will stay guilty and serve his or her sentence. A jury trial can be a very technical process. There is always the chance of error that might entitle the defendant to a new trial, perhaps years later, when the evidence or witnesses have disappeared. <laughs> when, the, when the evidence disappears? My goodness. <laughs> That is definitely, that is definitely something that we're familiar with. That is definitely on our, on our radar. Okay, let's go forward then to, I think it's page 58. Because there was no mention there, obviously, of 
uh, you know, the district attorney says to one of the members of the family, can you act as the family spokesperson? And this is this is point number one, okay, Mike? Um, it's always been presented that, you know, well, Tim didn't do it because he wasn't good at speaking. Nobody had to speak. Nobody. As it says here, you have, as, as, as a family, you have the right to say no to an interview. Never feel that because you have unwillingly been involved in an incident of public interest that you must personally share the details and or your feelings with the general public. If you decide that you want the public to be aware of how traumatic and unfair, and unfair your victimization was, you dot, do not automatically have to give up your rights to privacy. By knowing and res requesting respect for your rights, you can be heard and yet not violated. Now, you do have, obviously, the right to select the spokesperson or advocate of your choice. Selecting one spokesperson, especially in multi-victim cases, eliminates confusion and contradictory statements. You also have the right to expect the media to respect your selection of a spokesperson or advocate. You have the right to select the time and location for media interviews. Remember, the media are governed by deadlines However, nobody should be subjected to a reporter arriving unannounced at the home of a victim. When you are traumatized, your home becomes your refuge. If you wish to protect your, the privacy of your home, select another location, such as a church meeting hall, office setting. It helps if you are familiar and comfortable with the surroundings. You have the right to request a specific reporter. Let's say you, you don't have to say anything. You don't have to speak to the to the press at all, Mike. You 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 um you really didn't have to. And certainly here in the UK, um, it's normally the spokesperson person is the lawyer handling the case because they are the ones that know the case inside and out. You know, and if this having to be the spokesperson is so traumatic that it makes you so nervous why do it as a consumer of daily news each of us identifies with or respects a reporter whom we may never have met we often form personal opinions about reporters whom we feel are thorough sensitive compassionate and objective if a newspaper, radio station or television station contacts you for an interview, don't hesitate to request the reporter you feel will provide accurate and full coverage of your story. You have the right to refuse an interview with a reporter, even though you have granted interviews to other reporters. You may feel that certain reporters are callous, insensitive, uncaring or judgmental. Is your right to avoid these journalists at all costs by refusing to speak to such reporters you may help them recognize their shortcomings in reporting victim related stories however recognize that the reporter may write the story regardless of your participation you have the right to release a written statement through a spokesperson in lieu of an interview why not just do that mike why not just do that you know you've got an older brother that apparently has got this speech impediment. Why not just get Tim to write a statement? Again, this is something we often get here in the UK. You know, the idea is that you 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 leave the victim's family alone. There may be times when you are emotionally incapable of speaking with the media, but you still wish to express your point of view. Writing and distributing your statement through a spokesperson allows you to express your views without personally granting interviews. That, that's what you wish you'd have done before you've talked about the grieving process lasting for days. You have the right to exclude children from interviews. You have the right to refrain from answering any questions with which you are uncomfortable or that, or, or that you feel are inappropriate. Again, you didn't mind 
saying that you should never feel you have to answer a question just because it's been asked. You have the right to know in advance what direction the story about your victimization is going to take. You have the right to ask for review of your quotations in a storyline prior to publication. Okay. Yeah. You have the right to avoid a press conference atmosphere and speak to only one reporter at a time. Uh, you have the right to demand a retraction when inaccurate information is reported. You have the right to ask that offensive photographs or visuals be it omitted for airing or publication. You have the right to conduct a television interview using a silhouette or a newspaper interview without having your photograph taken. You have the right to completely give your side of the story related to your victimization. You have the right to refrain from answering reporters' questions during trial. You know, this whole article about the media is, is how you keep them at a safe, safe distance. There's nothing in here that suggests, you know, it would be a good idea if one of you did alternate, alternate interviews with the, with the attorney, the district attorney. Because it's just bizarre. Because you would just get the district attorney that knows or supposedly knows a case inside out to give all of the interviews you have the right to file a formal complaint against a reporter uh, you have the right to grieve in privacy exactly you have the right to suggest training about media and victims for print and electronic media in your community you have the right at all times to be treated with dignity and respect by the media absolutely Okay, so that was a bit heavy going, but never mind. Um, got there in the end. Yeah, um, I'm just going to uh, leave it there. I've got so much more that I need to get through um, articles that have that I've come across. Um, just to say that. I did get another um, email from Mark Godsey. So everything seems, so let me just do this, from Mark Godsey, the, the author of Blind Injustice, and everything seems to be set up for um, a week tomorrow at three o'clock in the afternoon, my time. That is uh, five hours previously, 10, 10 in the morning in, um, East Coast time. Uh, so we'll, um, we'll look forward. Um, so we'll look forward to having a chat with him. Uh, Mill Billy sharing a little bit here about the uh, Colburn case. Let's just have a look. So Ludwig granting in part motion to granting what to withdraw as attorney attorney Lee leave i'm terminated parties shall provide notice on the docket on or before january 4th regarding whether they intend to retain a private mediator or agree to have the court refer the matter to a magistrate judge for the purposes of mediation i take it we haven't heard anything yet about what's happened mill billy otherwise i'm sure you would have you would have alerted us to that. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, Donna, that's uh, that's absolutely true. You know, they the the, the problem with the the grieving process is it, it starts off with that uh, you know the, the sort of grief side of it. Um, and they just cannot accept that a loved one is gone. It's just that they just can't accept this. You know, this, this whole idea that the grieving process could last days. Okay, we'll catch you all soon. Take care. Bye for now.